In the 1980s, I bought a Miata 1000. It was considered one of the finest touring bikes on the market at the time. And for the vast majority of my touring miles, it's been my steady companion. In the 2000s, along came the surly long haul trucker. Seemed like over half the bike tourists I met on the road were riding long haul truckers. Of course, I always rode my Miata 1000, you know, with the down tube friction shifters. I'm kind of a dinosaur. So I decided to go full on 21st century and get myself a 2023 Surly Disc Trucker. The Disc Trucker pretty much replaces the long haul trucker in the Surly line. So I went down to my local bike shop and looked at new bikes. There were two things that drew me to the Disc Trucker. Obviously disc brakes, but the other one, fat tires. Where it says fatties fit fine, they mean the tires. The frame will actually take tires up to 47 millimeters or two and a half inches. I'm looking for an expedition bike, one that can handle fully loaded touring on all kinds of roads. Gravel, pavement, all kinds of stuff. This might be that bike. It cost 2,000 US dollars. They didn't have one in the shop, so we had to order it online. I left a small down payment and waited about two weeks. I chose the 56 centimeter frame with 700 C wheels, and of course, in black. The other color choice, some pukey looking green color, but like Henry Ford said, any color you like, as long as it's black. So, black it is. First off, this is not a lightweight bike. It's pretty beefy. It's definitely built for the long haul. The frame and fork are made out of 4130 chromoly steel. The main triangle is double butted and TIG welded. The durable gloss black paint is applied by Ed coating. It's kind of like this electrostatic paint job. Maybe that's why the dirt just sticks to it and the decals come off real easy. The head tube has been slightly elongated to create a higher stack and hopefully a more comfortable riding position. The sloping top tube is the result of a slightly shortened seat tube, allowing for just a little bit more standover room. Of course, all in the name of comfort. There's lots of brazons for all kinds of luggage options. Although, I've heard some minor grumblings about the lack of a kickstand mount. I guess some people like to use a kickstand. The chain stay's been shortened by about 10 millimeters compared to previous versions. This is supposed to make the bike just a little bit more responsive and nimble under fully loaded touring conditions. The fork has a 12 by 100 millimeter through axle and the frame set up with a 12 by 142 millimeter through axle. The through axles seem a little bit beefier than traditional axles. They're less likely to bend, flex, or break. And this should add another level of stiffness and responsiveness to the frame. When fully loaded on rough roads, this bike stays smooth, sure, and steady. Yeah, the bike doesn't come equipped with a front or rear rack. So I got me a genuine Surly rear rack and had that installed. And that was over $100. I use an Arco Lowrider front rack when I'm out touring. But when I'm not touring, I leave it off. The bike comes with flat mount disc brake calipers and 160 millimeter rotors. Another complaint I've heard is because of the flat mount calipers, there's no way to upgrade to larger rotors. You're kind of stuck with what you have. I'm new to disc brakes, so the size of the rotor wasn't really my biggest concern. I like the stopping power of disc brakes over rim brakes, especially in the rain. But I had two concerns. One, will the brakes be noisy? And two, what if the rotor warps? Is that gonna rub on the brake pads and slow me down? But so far, so good. I'm careful not to touch the rotors, because I heard if you get any finger grease on the rotors, they start to make squeaky noises. Also, I'm careful not to bang anything into the rotors, especially when I'm unloading and loading it into my vehicle. I guess I have another concern too. One of these days, I'm gonna have to change the brake pads and adjust them. And since I'm new to disc brakes, I'll just have to figure it out when the time comes. So far though, I don't miss my rim brakes. The bike comes with a three x nine drivetrain with Olivio front and rear derailleurs. Comes with a 46, 36, 26 triple chainring set and a 34 by 11 cassette in the rear. 
Some consider Olivio derailers to be entry level or mid level parts, which I'm sure under most circumstances is probably okay. But on a high quality touring bike, I'd like to see high quality components. The hierarchy of Shimano components from best to worst goes something like this. XTR, XT, SLX, Dior, Olivio, Acera, and Altus. Why build a high-end expedition bike with low-end parts? Personally, I'd like to see XT components on my bike, or Dior at the very least. Also, it comes with a 165 millimeter crank set. I prefer 170 millimeter cranks. So, some things had to be changed, and I know that can get expensive sometimes. This is when having an ongoing rapport with your local bike shop comes in handy. If you just walk into a bike shop for the first time and you don't know the people, this probably won't work. But I'm on a first name basis with my local bike shop owner. I'm in his shop all the time and I spend a lot of money there. I guess some men have a problem hanging out at bars and spending money. I have a problem hanging out at the bike shop and spending money. So fortunately for me, he was willing to work with me on exchanging and upgrading some parts. As long as those parts were already in the shop and he didn't have to order them. He upgraded my 9-speed Olivio rear derailleur to an XT 10-speed they had laying around in the back of the shop. He swapped out my 9-speed cassette for a 10. He also upgraded my Olivio front derailleur to an XTR. He also swapped out the 165mm crank set with a 170mm crank set. So this meant a change in chain rings. I went from 46, 36, 26 to a 42, 32, 22 which at first, I wasn't so sure about. It seemed kind of low for me. But I got used to it pretty quick, and now I like those small chain rings. It gives me a better selection of mid-range gears and the lowest granny gear I've ever seen. What about the cockpit? The bike comes with surly truck stop handlebars. They're basically wide drop bars with a slight rise. The bike comes with Olivio brake levers and shifters. The saddle is a WTB Volt Sport. So I knew I was gonna have to change the bars, the stem, the shifters, the levers, and the saddle. So I supplied the handlebars, the stem, the brake levers, the saddle, and the pedals. And I let them keep those parts that the bike came with. I just exchanged them one for one. Seemed fair enough to me since he was willing to upgrade my shifters and my entire drivetrain for basically no charge. I like to use an old pair of mountain bike pedals or touring pedals. I still use toe clips. Pretty old school, I know. But I'm just not comfortable with those clipless pedals. And again, I'm not a racer. I love my Terry Liberator saddle. I've got one on every bike I ride. It's not too hard, it's not too soft, it's just right. I use these walled upright handlebars. I put a link in the description down below. I also use a Redshift shock absorbing stem. I got old sports injuries in my neck and shoulders that sometimes give me trouble when I ride. The little rubber bumpers inside the stem absorb some of the shock and road vibration that's transferred from your hands and your arms into your shoulders and neck. I did not cut the steering tube. I left it long. This added even more stack height, but it also left some space between the headset and the stem. I put a straight stem there to take up that space, but that's where I'm going to mount my handlebar bag. That way my handlebar bag is not really attached to my handlebars, because if it was, it would kind of reduce the effectiveness of the shock absorbing stem. I get a lot of comments on my YouTube channel about my upright riding position. Usually from older guys looking for more comfort, not from younger guys looking for more speed. I'm sure riding upright like that is less aerodynamic and less efficient for speed compared to riding in a drop position, which to me is just uncomfortable. For me, riding upright when bike touring over long distances is way more comfortable. It puts less stress on my neck, shoulders, arms, and hands. As a tourist, I'm really not in a big hurry to get anywhere anyway. Also, when riding upright, I can view the scenery better. I started a course with drop bars, probably like everyone else, and for years, I rode all crouched down, staring at the road just three feet in front of my bike. It's hard to see the scenery that way, and it puts extra stress on your neck and shoulders. And eventually, it made my hands hurt too. So one day, I turned my drop bars up, which I learned later is called gangster style or Chicago style. Kind of made me laugh, because when we were teenagers, that's how we would ride, with the drop bars turned up. I guess we thought we were pretty cool. But I also learned pretty quick that this could be dangerous 
especially in a heartbreaking situation, so I don't recommend it. So I turned to mountain bike bars. I liked them because they put me more upright and took weight off my hands, but the grips were too wide apart and became really uncomfortable over time. Then I found these bars. I tried them and I like them. They got me upright, but they also put my hands and wrists in a more comfortable, neutral position. If that didn't work, my next option was an old set of ape hangers. Just kidding. Now the problem with this setup is there's not enough room on the hand grips for both brake levers and shifters at the same time. So I came up with a workaround. I took handlebar extenders and I shortened them a bit and I mounted them right underneath the hand grips. That's where I mounted the shifters, so they're still close enough to reach with your fingers and thumb. I know it's a goofy looking setup, but it works for me. Kind of reminds me of a little girl's bike. The only thing missing are the little pink streamers coming off the hand grips. So what about the wheels? The bike comes with a set of Alex Adventurer 2 rims and Novatec 36 spoke hubs. The front hub, as mentioned earlier, is a 12 by 100 through axle, and the rear has a 12 by 142 through axle. The bike comes equipped with a set of Surly Extra Terrestrial 41 millimeter tires. They seem pretty okay for trail and gravel riding, but a bit sluggish on paved roads. So for road riding, I installed a set of 38mm Schwalbe Marathons. But the factory wheel set seemed adequate for the task at hand, so I just went with it. Now before making this review, I rode the bike for several hundred miles on rail trails, and I went for a 1200 mile bike tour in Wisconsin and Northern Illinois. I tested it out on a variety of roads, rail trails, and canal towpaths, smooth and bumpy paved roads, and even threw in some gravel roads to boot. After all that riding, I didn't break a single spoke. After I got home from my trip, I went for a day ride on my local rail trail. Within the first two miles, out of nowhere, I heard this ping come from my rear wheel. My heart sank, because I knew right away I just broke a spoke. Or as they say in the upper Midwest, I just broke a spoke, you betcha, eh? Bummer, any confidence that I once had in this wheel set was now gone. I took the bike home, removed the rear wheel and marched it down to my local bike shop. I had them replace every spoke in the rear wheel with DT Swiss double butted spokes. And I didn't stop there. I had them build me a whole new set of wheels. I figure it's always good to have a spare set of wheels anyway. I like the Adventurer 2 rims, so I went with those. But I wanted Shimano 105 hubs and DT Swiss spokes. I also like the fact that the wheels are hand built and not machine built. The new wheel set cost me about 400 bucks, but I don't ever want to break a spoke again. So what's better than having a spoke holder built into the frame of your bike? Having quality wheels that don't ever break spokes. So what do you think of the new Surly Disc Trucker? I don't work for Surly and this isn't a paid advertisement. I'm not a professional bike mechanic, I'm just a seasoned long distance bike tourist that knows what he likes. And after test riding the Surly Disc Trucker, this is what I think. Like I said, I'm looking for an expedition bike. Something that can handle loaded long distance touring on all kinds of roads. And this seemed to be a good choice. I've done most of my touring on an old Miata 1000, sometimes called the Cadillac of touring bikes. The steel frame is sturdy, but it's got a little bit of flex to it, and that's what makes it comfortable, as long as you're on smooth paved roads. But it wasn't really built for the rough stuff. And unfortunately, it can only take tires up to about 32 millimeters, which makes a lot of roads unsuitable. Not the case with the Disc Trucker. This is an expedition bike, and short of a muddy trail, this bike can handle almost anything you throw at it. This is like the Buick of bicycles. One complaint about the Miata 1000 was that under a full load, sometimes the frame could feel a little noodly, if you know what I mean. I didn't notice any noodling with the disc trucker frame. The frame felt solid and sturdy, even under a load. Now when unloaded, it can feel a little bit stiff. 
but the fat tires absorb some of that stiffness, making for a little more comfortable ride. But under a full load, this bike is pretty unwavering. It might be my imagination, but I think I did notice a little bit more responsiveness in the frame, especially when I stepped on it. Now I'm not a racer, but there are some times when I too have the need for speed. So I was a little surprised when I felt a little spring in these old legs. Was that my legs I felt? Or was that the shorter chainstay and the stiffer through axle talking? At first, I was a little bit suspicious about those through axles. I wasn't sure what to make of them. They look kind of like quick release, but they don't pop off, they spin off. And how do you get the wheel off anyway? Kind of weird. But once I figured it out, getting the wheels on and off was really no problem. I had no problems with the through axles, and they definitely look stronger and stiffer than traditional axles. I thought the shorter chainstay would bring my panniers closer to the pedals and maybe cause some heel clipping, but that never happened. Even with the shorter chainstay, there was plenty of room between my heels and the panniers. I love the fat tires. As long as they're properly inflated, they roll just fine. With my skinny tire bike, I was always afraid to venture onto rough and rocky roads. I was always afraid I was going to bend a rim or get a pinch flat. You know, when you hit a rock just right and it pinches the tire and tube on the rim, it punctures the tube and your tire goes flat. I hate those. But with fat tires, no such thing as pinch flats. I had no problems with the disc brakes. The rotors didn't warp and rub against the pads at all. They had plenty of braking power even in the rain. Now after the rain, the rotors did squeak a little bit, but once the rotors dried off, it didn't last. I like Surly bikes. I own more than one. I also have a Troll and a Crosscheck. And I know there's other high-end, high-performing touring bikes out there. But it seems to me, from my very informal, unscientific study, that a lot of people ride these disc truckers. So I know they're popular bikes. Even if they're not the most high-performing bikes, people still like them. And I even saw the video with Amy, the production manager, and Ben, the design engineer for the Surly Disc Trucker. Now maybe I too got suckered into a slick advertising campaign, I don't know. But I think Surly bikes are pretty cool. Maybe riding a Surly just makes you feel cooler than riding other bikes. It's kind of like Surly is to bicycles, what Harley Davidson is to motorcycles. And yeah, I also own a Harley. But here's my beef, but here's my beef, but here's, but here's my beef. Why build a high-end touring bike with entry-level parts? And $2,000 is pretty high-end. Alivio, Sora, come on. Us long-distance bikers can venture into some pretty remote places, and we put a high premium on dependability and simplicity, especially when bike shops are few and far between. Entry-level components don't fill me with a lot of confidence, and they don't give me peace of mind when traveling far. A bike of the caliber of a surly disc trucker should have high-end components, like XT, or Dior at the very least. There, I said it. One more thing. Wheels with anything less than DT Swiss double-butted spokes don't belong on a touring bike. In my opinion, the most important part of a touring bike is the rear wheel. It carries most of the load, and it should be bomb-proof. It's better to have high-quality wheels and never break a spoke than to have a built-in spoke holder on your frame. But again, that's my opinion. So anyways, I love my disc trucker. With a few modifications and upgrades, I've got a quality expedition bike. I feel confident that this bike can take me just about anywhere. And I hope I still have many more miles left in these old legs. My dream is to one day ride my bike to Alaska. You coming? If that dream ever does come true, I think this will be the bike to take me there. I hope to see you down the road. Thanks for watching. Now go ride your bike.